Okay. Um, I don't know what to call this, so you're going to have to help me out here. Um, I'm thinking uh, the Tudor area, the Elizabethan era, or the Georgian era. It, it could be a combination of those. There's even a couple earlier than that, so I'm not exactly sure. I'm just going to call, I'm, right now, if I can't find a better term, these are uh, murder mysteries in uh, 1500 to 1700. There's one even earlier than that, so I'm not even sure. Um, so these are early, early um, amateur sleuths, maybe? Um, and welcome to the D. Louise book series. I'm Christina Kyrs, T I N A, and it's uh, it's nice to meet you. And I uh, hope you're having a, a, a good day. Uh, I, this is day, this is night, my era. Um, I trying to do some learning some sign language. I'm good at dishing it up, but I'm not good at receiving, so I need to practice. And I approached a group of deaf people in the library of the day and I totally blew it totally blew it totally absolutely blew it I wanted to ask about a deaf club or a social club where I can merge myself so that that's the only language spoken like when I want to learn German you go into a room where only German is spoken so you're forced to my biggest problem is I can dish it out but I can't receive it so I need to learn how to read the signs and how to interpret the signs when someone else is telling me a story. And uh, so that's taking some practice. So I'm trying to do that. Um, but years ago, years and years and years and years and years ago, I worked as an interpreter. Can you believe that crap? But it was very, very short period of time. And I was horrible at it too, by the way. Um, but anyways, back to the books here. Um, I'm starting with the middle of the Tudor area. Um, there's a couple of books that are much earlier than that. Some of these books I've done videos on previously, so uh, please check those out. We'll get to those. So this is our if then. If you like this book, maybe you like this book or this author. So these are the if then, um, and this is Friday, and I hope you watched Star Trek earlier today. I'm working really hard on those. Um, and also Flashback Mondays, where we talk about Romantic Times Book Review Magazine, where I go through historicals, regencies, mystery, suspense, contemporary, um, inspirational. We do harlequins. We do paranormal. We cover the whole broad spectrum of books that you might be reading or suggest to reading uh, that you haven't heard of before. And these authors are still existing today. You can still find their books and bookstores, Amazon, all over the place. But anyways, we have been doing lately um, the Beatrice Small saga, uh, Sky O'Malley saga by Beatrice Small. And these all take place in the 1500s. So these these are romance. And please check, these were these take several hours to read. Um, I did an audio book on this one, so it took 11 hours. And through most of it, I was crying. It was it was made just for me, and no one else was ever going to hear it. I've never actually played it back. It's on cassette. But I remember sitting and reading the book aloud and crying my eyes out when I first read it. So we'll get to that. So we're doing books uh, for this particular uh, If Then, books between 1500 and 1700. That means books that take place between 1500 and 1700 and there's one or two that take place even earlier than that um actually there's two and a couple of these i've done videos on before so like i said check them out um so the first one is murder at hatfield house and we've done videos on these in 1558 england kate hayward a simple musician in the employ of a princess will find herself involved in games of crowns as she sets out to solve murder of the queen's envoy. England is in turmoil, turmoil over under the rule of Queen Mary and her Spanish husband. Confined to house arrest at Hatfield House, young Princess Elizabeth is the country's greatest hope. 
Far from court intrigues, Elizabeth finds solace in simple things, the quiet countryside and peaceful recreation, including the melodies of her chief musician and his daughter, Kate Howard. But Kate will prove herself most valuable when an envoy of the queen sent to flush out Hedericks in the prince's household is found dead on the grounds of Hatfield. Acting as Elizabeth's eyes and ears, Kate is sent out on the trail of a killer whose ears, whose eyes and ears, um, Kate is sent out on the trail of a killer whose mission could destroy her family, friends, and the future of England. And I, I didn't like a couple of people in this story at all. It just killed it for me. But you should check it out. If, um, it's, it's a good book. It is a good mystery, though. Um, so we'll do uh, Robin Blake, uh, a doc, a dark ana in anatomy, but, and it's a Craig and Fidelis mystery. I was looking for partners. I was looking for Starsky and Hutch stuff, and this is looking up. Um, the year is 1740. George II is on the throne. But England's remoter provinces remain largely a law unto themselves. In Lancashire, Land a grim discovery has been made. A squire's wife, Dolores Brockle Tower, lies in the woods above her home. Garlic Hall, her throat brutally slashed. Called to the scene, Coroner Titus Craig finds the Brockle Tower household awash with rumor and suspicion. He enlists the help of his astute young friend, Dr. Luke Fidelis, to throw light on the case. But this is a world in which forensic science is in its infancy and policing hardly exists. Embarking on their first gripping investigation, Craig and Fidelis are faced with the superstition of witnesses, obstruction by local officials, and denunciation from the squire himself. This rollicking stuff. Craig and Fidelis are engaging duo. Okay. Um. Okay. Eleanor Kuntz. Uh, a simple murder. This it takes place in America, and this takes place during the American Revolution. Five years ago, while Reese was still rec a little after the war, five years ago, while Reese was still recovering from his stint as a Revolutionary War soldier, his beloved wife died. Devastated, Will Reese left his son David in his sister's care, fled his main farm, and struck out for a tough but emotionally empty life as a traveling weaver. Now, upon returning unexpectedly to his farm. Reese discovers that David has been treated like a serf for years and finally ran away to join a secluded sect, the Shakers. Overwhelmed by guilt and hoping to reconcile with the son, Reese immediately follows David to Shaker community. But when a young Shaker woman is brutally murdered after Reese's arrival, Reese finds himself launched into a complicated investigation where the bodies keep multiplying. A tangled web of family connections casts suspicions on everyone, and the beautiful woman on the edge of the Shaker community might be hiding troubling ties to the victims. It comes, quickly becomes clear that in solving Sister Chastity's murder may well expose some of the Shaker community's darkest secrets, not to mention endanger his own life. And this one, I did a video on. Um, I was calling her the first detective. You will have to check that out this last year. Uh, Lindsay Davis, and I'm going to do the rest of these. I just haven't gotten to it. A Flavia, Flavia Albia mystery, The Ides of April. I did a video on this. Um, uh, it's first of a new series of crime novels set in ancient Rome and featuring Flavia Albia, the adopted daughter of the much-loved Marcus Didius Falco. Based on real historical events, mysterious poisonings in which victims died, often unaware they had been attacked, Albia is now 28 and an established female investigator. Her personal history and her British birth enable her to view Roman society 
and its traditions as a bemused outsider and also a woman struggling for independence in a man's world. The first novel takes place on Plebeian Aventine Hill with its mix of monumental temples, muddy back lanes, and horrible snack bars. We meet Albia's personal circle, some familiar, some new. We glimpse old haunts and hear of old friends, but the focus is on Albia herself, a tough, witty, winning personality who fearlessly tackles humanity, injustice, braving any risks, and winning the friendship of unexpected allies. And she solves the murder. Um, let's see. It doesn't say in the flap either. Uh, working oh, working as a private former informer in Rome during the reign of Domitia, Flavia has taken over her father's old ramshackle digs at Fountain Court in the suburbia district, where she piles her trade with energy, determination, and the usual faco luck or lack of it. Recently hired to help investigate a fatal accident, she finds herself struck with an aw truly awful person for a client and facing a well-heeled, well-connected opponent. That is until her client unexpectedly dies under what might be called suspicious circumstances. While this is not a huge loss for society, it is a loss for Flavia's pocket. Even worse, it's just one of a series of similar deaths, where Albia and her allies try to find and stop the killer. He, he in turn stalks them through their own territory, bringing death ever close to their home. This was a good story. I enjoyed it. So you'll have to check it out and the video. Um, did I do this? Do this, do this? No. No. Okay. John Pick Pilker Pilkington, The Ruffler's Child. Thomas the Faulkner Mystery Series. Book one starts in 1587. The story moves at a great pace. She's always got to go off to my videos. Always. No matter what time of day I do a video, she goes off. Oh, good. No beings. Okay. Um, the story moves at a great pace. It made a welcome change to discover Elizabethan England through the eyes of a lesser mortal. The historical novel's review. Tom, Thomas Finbo is more than a humble falconer. In the service of Sir Robert Vickery and Lady Margaret, he is a widowed father, a skilled ex-soldier, and a tenacious hunter. Far from the court and corruption of London, Thomas resides in the picturesque Berkshire Downs. All as it should be until Lady Margaret's loathsome brother is found murdered. To distract her from mourning, Lady Margaret travels to London in search of Grey Falcon, with Thomas accompanying her. However, when they reach the city, things take a dark turn. Secrets begin to unravel, and it becomes clear that the murder of Lady Margaret's brother is only a small piece of the greater puzzle. Once Thomas starts to put the pieces together, he realizes that he and his mistress are in grave danger. With a target on their back, Thomas must come face to face with some of London's most fearsome criminals. Chasing the truth at all costs, the falconer's wits and strengths are put to the test. A tale of murder, lust, and courage, Thomas Fimbo must reveal a secret of the past in order to make sense of the present. Um, Graham Black, Death in Delft, D-E-L-F-T. Three young girls have been abducted from their homes. The body of one has been found in a shallow grave. The other two are missing. The murder has shocked everyone in the peaceful city of Delft, and the mayor is desperate to catch the perpetrator before panic can spread any further. With the bitterly cold January weather intensifying, it is doubtful that the other two girls are still alive, but whoever took them is still at large. The mayor requests the help of Master Mercionius, a gifted cleric from a nearby university, and a local artist, Vimia, who uses his skills to sketch the crime scenes. Can they find the missing girls before it's too late? Will Mercurius be able to track down the killer? Uh, right. This next one is a little earlier, um, but it's close. It's David Penny, The Red Hill, 
It's in 1482 Granada in the shadow of Al Alhambra. Death whispers through the palace halls, calling for a hero to unveil its secrets. Englishman and physician Tom Barrington finds himself summoned to solve a string of brutal, brutal murders that have left the Sultan's court in fear. Reluctantly drawn into the heart of the mystery, Thomas's investigation takes a dire turn when the Sultan's wife is found savagely slain. With the help of George, a sharp-witted eunuch, Thomas embarks on a perilous journey through the labyrinth of palace intrigue and deception. As they edge closer to the killer, they realize <coughs> the palace harbors secrets darker than they ever imagined. And trust becomes a luxury they cannot afford. Thomas's investigation lays bare the secrets of the Red Hill and the people who inhabit him. His discoveries culminate in a battle not only for his own life, but for the lives of those he loves. The Alchemist's Daughter. Bianca Goodard employs her knowledge of herbs and medicinal plants to concoct remedies for the disease-riddled poor in London squalid Southwark. Slum. But when her friend Jalen comes to her complaining of severe stomach pain, Bianca's description seems to kill her on the spot. Recovering from her shock, Bianca suspects Jalen may have been poisoned before coming to her, but the local constable is not so easily convinced. To clear her name and to keep her neck free of the gallows, Bianca must apply her knowledge of the healing arts to deduce exactly how her friend was murdered and by whom before she herself was victim for similar fate. And if you haven't um, seen my video for Sarah Penna, The Apothecary, that was a good book. You should watch my video on that from last year. Um, Ruth Downey, this is a little early, it's 122 AD, it's before the others, this is the earliest one I think of the, of the books, well that one in the Alf, Al, Althea, Albia, the Flavia. Um, when Russo rejoins his unit in the remote outpost of the Roman Empire known as Britannia, he finds that that not is all well with the 20th Legion. As they keep a suspicious eye on the barbarians to the north, the Legion heirs begin to have found trouble even closer to home. Among the native recruits to Britannia's Imperial Army, a young soldier has jumped off a roof, killing himself. Why? Mysterious injuries and even deaths begin to pile up in Russo's medical ledgers, and it soon becomes clear that this suicide is not an isolated incident. Can the men really be under a curse, and what has this to do with the much-decorated centurion Gemius? Bound by his sense of duty and ill-advised curiosity, Russo begins to ask questions nobody wants to hear. Meanwhile, his barbarian wife, Tilla, starts to find out some of the answers and is marked as a security risk by the very own officers Russo is interrogating. Interesting. Tessa Howard. This... 1780, The Apprentices, The Autonomous Apprentice. Uh, in 18th century England, the murder of Sir Edward Crick sends a torrent of gossip through Oxfordshire, although aside from his sister, Lydia, Lady Lydia Farrell, a few among the young men. Uh, when Lady Farrell's husband becomes the prime suspect in the murder, she enlists the help of Dr. Thomas Silkstone, an autonomous and pioneering forensic detective, to prove his innocence. Silkstone's unconventional methods have made him an outsider. Still, he agrees to examine Sir Edward's corpse, but the keenest blade he will use is his intellect. Uh, there's a little more information here. 
Uh, Thomas arrived in England to study under its former surgeon, where his unconventional methods only add to his outsiderness. Against his better judgment, he agrees to examine Sir Edward's corpse, but is not only the dead, but also the limit to whom he must deal with. Okay. All right. Two more. The Net of Steel, Fiona Buckley. In 1590, Ursula Stannard's the Queen's half-sister and occasional secret agent has just left Sir Francis Walsingham's funeral when she is summoned back to her childhood home. Faladine housed by her aunt, Uncle Herbert has died suddenly from natural causes, but Ursula's arrival in Sussex Down triggers a shocking sequence of death and devastation. Through her service to the Queen, Ursula has made dangerous enemies. The formidable Mercer brothers are set on revenge, and their cruelty knows no limits. As a deadly net closes around Ursula and her loved ones, can she keep those dearest to her safe and stop the Mercers before they strike again? And our final one from a more popular and well-known author. Oh, it's also got the good paper. I always say, you know, if an author's good with the publisher, they get the good paper, the expensive paper. Um, I don't have the year for this. Uh, brother turns on brother to win the ultimate prize, the throne of England, in this dazzling account of the wars of the Plagnets. They are the claimants and kings who ruled England before the Tudors, and now Philippia Gregory brings them to life through dramatic and intimate stories of the secret players. The indomitable one starring with Elizabeth Woodville, the White Queen. Oh, this was just during the time period. It wasn't. Um, oh, well, we'll include it anyway. The White Queen tells the story of a woman of extraordinary beauty and ambition who, catching the eye of the newly crowned boy king, marries him in secret and ascends to royalty. While Elizabeth rises to the demands of her exalted position and fights for the success of her family, her two sons become central figures in a mystery that has confounded historians for centuries. The missing princess is in the Tower of London, whose fate is still unknown. From her uniquely qualified perspective, Philippa explores the most famous unsolved mystery of English history, informed by impeccable research and framed by her intimate storytelling skills. So, not exactly the detective one of all the others, but it takes place during that time. And, oh, we all make mistakes. So, I hope you enjoy these uh, 12, 12 or so books. And uh, I hope you will check them out. And don't forget, um, Flashback Mondays, Star Trek Fridays, and this series here. If then, maybe you'll find some authors you like and help me out with the the two door I think we're going to be going with the two door name we'll see what happens please hit the like and subscribe as of this recording I've lost five subscribers this week I can I'll nev I'm never going to hit 200 going at this rate um, dreams of a thousand are becoming unrealistic as the day goes on so please hit the like and subscribe thank you so much for tuning in